Hello and welcome to the Skeptics Track. Thank you for joining us. Um, so today we're going to talk to this illustrious panel of experts on creativity. Right? No pressure there. <laughs> so let's have each of you uh, uh, introduce yourselves, please. Uh, I'm Roxanne Spashouse, Intuitive Research and NeedCoffee.com's Weekend Justice Podcast. Hello, my name is Leanne Lord. I am a stand-up comedian, author, podcaster, and um, all things me are at VeryFunnyLady.com. Uh, my name is Ian Harris. I'm a comedian and voiceover actor, um, and that's pretty much it. I am Jane Crow. I am a musician, a singer, songwriter, and pianist, and I front my own band, The Murder of Jane Crow. <laughs> uh, I'm Michael A. Stackpole. I'm a science fiction author, uh, fantasy author, write a lot of tie ins Star Wars books, everything like that, and been a skeptic and nigh on to forever. Kurt Anderson, a uh, magician, and I lecture and work some in the field of lying, deception, deception, detection. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Okay, so I, I'm certain that one of the questions y'all hear the most commonly is, how do you get your ideas? Is that the only question that drives you bananas, or do you have a good answer to that? I guess not. I guess not. Okay, <laughs> there, there, there really isn't. Um, uh, as an art director for years, um, we steal from everybody. We just make sure that it's no copyright infringement on anything we do. And for me, the, the, the answer is ideas are, are abound. And the, the real trick is not just having the idea, but capturing the idea. Because if you don't, you don't capture it or write it down in some way, I, I, I always say and believe that ideas are jealous things. And so if you don't acknowledge the idea, it, it says, oh, you don't want me, I'm going to go to someone else. And then a week later, a year later, someone else has written that joke or that book or filmed that movie because you didn't acknowledge the idea. Mm. And for me as a, a comic, I like to go, because I do comedy skepticism or skeptical comedy now, um, for most of what I do, I actually try to look at the things that I think are funny naturally to me, you know? Um, and, you know, whatever it is, it's ghost, Bigfoot, religion, whatever, and, and sit down and examine the ridiculousness of that, and then turn that into into jokes. You know, so it's actually targeting what it is I want to talk about. And mine, as a uh, songwriter, a lot of my ideas come from just. I guess everyone who is here thinks a lot, and your mind is always going. If you are like me, so you know, it just comes from experience and just the thoughts that are running around that I can focus into something. But I mean, any idea comes from. Your noodle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, reading a lot, uh, just being generally aware and and <laughs> observing, watching how people function, uh, contributes to all of this stuff. I'm kind of lucky since I work um, in in a longer form and it's, get to spend a, a lot longer time playing with the ideas. I get a chance to examine them from all different points of view and try and uh, present those contrasting point of views uh, in what I'm doing. So I try to think of something that would be cool that you can't actually do, and then try to figure out a way to make it look like I can. And oftentimes, I, some of my best ideas come out of bad ideas. So I go, oh, mm -hmm. this would be cool. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work. And I'm like, ah. Oh. But I learned this principle, and I went, oh, I could do this instead, and that's even cooler. So it's, it's always, and I'm sure with any creativity, it's a process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times a finished product, you go, well, that's so simple and beautiful. How'd you do that? And you go, well, I made like 19 mistakes, <laughs> yeah. and I was trying to do something else, and I came up with this, and I just take credit for this instead. Mm -hmm. So Great. Only 19. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's, we call that bragging. I'm trying to look like a professional, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the cool thing that you guys have that is different from me is I have... I work for clients, so my ideas are technically for them, so I almost have to give my ideas away, to, so, so to speak, you know. So um, I guess really quick, is that different when, like, the joke thing, you, when somebody then uses an idea that you have, does that, like, does that get under your skin a bit? Well. In, in, in stand-up, it's, it's, I guess, a little bit different. There are, there are certain topics, you know, you could have a room of 20 comedians, 
and you know, some almost all of us have either been married or dating or have kids or have parents. And should you not talk about that because someone else is married? You know, the 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 twist or the trick there is, if all of us did jokes about that topic, it would all be different, mm -hmm. or it should all be different because it's coming from a different point of view. Um, but where we might be similar to you, where what you're producing is literally for someone else, is if you're, say, a writer on a TV show or a late night show, mm -hmm. and you are writing jokes for another comic mm -hmm. or for the host of that show. And I actually find that very, very difficult to do because I'm like, those, those, those are mine. I, I wrote that. <laughs> you know, it's very difficult to go, no, I wrote this for someone else and watch your words come out of someone else's mouth. Or some people enjoy seeing their words come out of someone mm -hmm. else's mouth, especially when you're being handsomely compensated for such. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. But then also sometimes I think the, the issue with that is that I, I've done that before, written for people, and I always feel like I'm not giving them my best because I want my best for myself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> am I doing what I should be doing here? Right. Um, and that, that's obviously difficult. But, but, if you're, but if you can understand their voice, you know, in comedy at least, their voice is different than my voice for sure. Um, especially because what I do is very s specific. So if I have relationship jokes or whatever, I'm not going to use them. So I have no problem giving them away to somebody else in that case. No, don't, don't, don't give it away. Make them pay. Oh, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, yes, you're right. I probably wouldn't give it away. Um, Kurt, no, I see, uh, Kurt makes a different uh, goblet for every <laughs> dragon con. So I'm curious if, and, and in addition to the, uh, his work is amazing. If you have a chance, come look at this wood burn. It's amazing. Um, but do you all find that you have other creative outlets in addition to the ones that have brought you to this panel? Uh, I guess not. Yeah, well, no, yeah, I mean, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes. Um, you know, a, a year ago, I just started doing uh, leather working, uh, and that's a lot of fun, very relaxing, and it's something entirely different. Um, and and uh, you, you know, when you're working on a novel and it's going to take three months, um, it's largely ephemeral. I mean, at, at best, you can measure it by a growing stack of paper, mm -hmm. and so it's hard to quantify and it's hard to get. Uh, your brain around that because it, 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 it seems very uh, magical and not real until it, it ends up in that form of a book that we all know. So in, in finding other creative outlets, uh, uh, I now can do things that have got a beginning, a middle, and an end that I can you know do inside a week or I can do inside a month and, and it's easy to measure and, and that, that makes me feel oddly more secure, uh, that I'm not going insane, uh, where instead the rest of my days is you know, staring at a pile of paper. Um, well, I do podcasting, uh, have been doing it for almost 10 years with uh, Need Coffee and their show Weekend Justice and The Unique Geek. Um, I'm also, I do like sort of memoir writing. Of, you know, so if I'm not like walking around problem solving for people, which is what marketing is, it's just people will constantly, it's like, we have an issue, we have a PR problem, how do we solve an issue? So um, for me, it's, you know, taking on something um, <clears throat> and even giving back. So I do a lot of like community work as well, so. I, I, I think for me, it just, it, it all, almost all grows out of the writing. You know, sometimes an idea will present itself to me as a stand-up idea, um, and then other times it won't, and I'm like, well, where does this fit? And then that's how I started or got back to uh, longer form writing, you know, and doing, you know, being an author and writing books. And then my podcast is really a storytelling podcast, so I actually write, again, it's writing um, the stories out, you know, that I share. And I, I don't know if this is considered creativity, but I, I love organization. I love making, you know, it, it, it's my way of organizing the chaos in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I, for me, it, that my creative outlet is making sure that my clear shoe boxes are, are labeled according to heel height, color, and season, <laughs> you know. There's creativity There's in that. Yeah, absolutely. In oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah like my clothes yeah. closet we is We just validated you. Thank you for validating me <laughs> and my madness, you know. So I'm going to go home and organize because my therapist is on vacation. <laughs> I do naked modern interpretive dance on Venice Beach, but they call that alcoholism. So I don't know. That's not really <laughs> creativity. But your YouTube channel is awesome. It is amazing. <laughs> I've got at least three subscribers. Uh, Bragging. And uh, 
kind of going going off of Leanne's point, um, organizing that is definitely a valid form of creativity. Okay. I do that as well. But I guess the overarching point I want to make to that is that once you do find a way to channel your creativity, you can begin to apply it in all aspects mm -hmm. of your life. Yes, it's yes. not just your art that you do. It's that yep. it's the way that you live. It becomes yeah. uh, something that I apply not only to art but to organization. Or I'm also a mother. The way that I parent, all of it. It's the creative process kind of gets into everything, and it just becomes a part of who you are and how you live your life. It, can I ask a serious question really quick uh, regarding all that? Um, is everybody here OCD? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, no. I mean, on some level, I mean, I'm wondering because I am, and it sounds Without like there's I some not. sort of, yeah. right? Do you, you mean di officially diagnosed no, or possibly just looking at clinical? what you do in the world and going, yeah? Po I, mean, I, I wonder how many people are, are super at least um, obsessive about what it is they do. I mean, you, do you have to be to be to be an, uh, to be artistic? Do you have to really be? I mean, that could just mean that you're good at what you do, or you're focused on what you do. But sometimes I find that I'm on many things, not just my comedy, but I'm super obsessive about it. It has to be exactly perfect, and mm -hmm. it drives people nuts. And I'm seeing it from other angles, and I'm just wondering how how how, how obsessive everybody gets with their stuff. Uh, why don't you go to that and then yeah. circle back? I, I'm not OCD at all, <laughs> but. When I when I get onto something or an idea, um, I, I do become obsessive about that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I. It, but it's more of like this is a standard that represents me, yes. um, and so like with the show, you know, like one of the things I've always said. I know so many magicians who put their kids in their show, and like until my kids are better than me at performing, they will never be in the show. This is not a dog and pony thing, right? Oh, right. Like. The, the standard of how I want to perform is actually higher than I perform at any given time, but I'm always working towards that. But I don't feel like it's an, it's an OCD thing. It's really more of a standard of quality. Mm. Um, and like when I do something like this, uh, again, if it was OCD, I would never finish anything <laughs> because it's never as good as what I'd like. But I just have this kind of standard that I'm trying to achieve, and I always fall short, and it pushes me to go a little farther. But I, my house is not organized, my <laughs> life is not organized, and when I find creativity outlets outside of the show, it's like the exact opposite. I think you feel that comfort in doing something totally different than what you're yeah, doing. Yeah. The show is constant thinking and trying to create something amazing and be funny and entertaining, and it, it's, it's all interaction, and this is just sit down in silence with a wood burner with hours and try to draw a picture. So it's completely different for me, but no OCD-ness at all to me. Yeah, it, it, for me, no OCD whatsoever. I, it, it, I mean, it's horrible. I, I can organize myself <laughs> in, in, doing, in doing projects, uh, and I think to a certain extent, it, it, for me anyway, the amount of concentration it takes to be able to do that, to, to create a world, keep it consistent, have, uh, create real characters and have them go through uh, experiences that are humanly relatable, even though this is an entirely made up world, the amount of focus that I, that I have to put in there just to recover it kind of necessitates letting other things slide. At least that's my excuse for never using a vacuum. Uh, I just, you know, that's, uh, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, no OCD whatsoever. But going down that rat hole, you know, being able to focus oh, yeah. on those things, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, that is oh, there. And that's, that's the best joints. part of the job, you know, and you wasted mm -hmm. a day, but you can tell yourself you're working. So, <laughs> so, so for me, when somebody pr presents a project to me, um, I always bill in a couple days to ponder. And that's what I call it. And they're like, well, what is that? Um, because I sort of go, it, it, for me, it's like a magpie. It's like, if I find a book on something, I might, you know, like Emily Dickinson, somehow might form a connection for a winery up in New York. And so for me, it's not an OCD thing because I have to gather a ton of different items for a project and then I toss. <laughs> so it's almost like get a lot and then just toss. So it's not really a, uh, an OCD thing. It's almost like sauntering in a way that you sort of meander. And if you do a lot of reading and you read other people's philosophies, it's like 
like Steve Jobs who took up calligraphy mm-hmm. and, and him taking up calligraphy gave him the idea of the Apple computer that you don't have to just sit there, you can use a mouse and stuff like that. So it's, it's a little bit more creativity in the way you think. And early on in my career as a graphic artist then working into problem solving, which is what an art director does, is um, we had a class called Thinking Drawing, and it was really cool. So basically, um, you just just write or draw, and you just ponder on stuff, and you just fill up notebooks and sheaves of paper, and then you just sort of look at it later, and it's just like, okay, no, yes, yes, no. So you mm-hmm. almost do your own algorithm of coming up with a solution. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But I, that, that, but actually, that happens. It, that, that actually feels like quite a, a gift and a skill mm-hmm. to allow yourself the time to do. Yeah, yeah because the, the, and the, actually having a client that says, okay, I'll pay you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that is the key thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, because then you have to also show your client, this is the successes I've had, this is why the price is this. Oh, yeah. You know, so there is that fine line because as creativity, creative, if whoever out there is a graphic artist or in the field, time and time again, you, even here, people think that creative folk have no value. If there's, it's Not like, well, no, I know, <laughs> or I'm talking to the, to the, you know, the choir, but Time and time again, people will come up to you and say, oh, what you do is fun, mm. which, so, which means <laughs> it should be free or yeah. nothing. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, paying for a joke, I don't know what the price is. I would never know what you charge somebody to say, here's a really cool. Apparently, it's exposure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's my favorite line. It's, it's, it's always, you know. Hey, you want to come in and work? It'll be great exposure. It's like how, how does how does doing a show at you know the Honda Corporation ex- give me exposure or whatever? It's always some kind of weird thing, and they always do that with artists. I, I don't. Mm-hmm. They never do it with anybody else. No. They never go. Hey, would you like to build this bridge? It, everyone will see it. Yeah. People will drive across it. It'll yeah. be great. A lot of people will give you more bridges to build for free. Yeah, actually, like they, they do do that. Do, do they? they? Yeah. I wow. Work on oh, yeah. Inf- influencers oh. are yeah. notorious. Well, I, I guess That's in a insane. capitalist system, insane. the goal is to exploit and get as much as Correct. possible. Yeah. Why would I pay you $10 if you'll accept five, right. and then I can tax you out of the rest of that? <laughs> um, you know, I, I would love to hope that it was greed like that, but I am convinced that there is an MBA program somewhere which has got a class called Exposure 101. <laughs> and they just teach people that it's an acceptable business practice that, that artists will love to work for exposure. And, and someone is making a lot of money teaching those classes. Yeah. So well, it's not even as smart as Greek. No, but right. you, get, you get students now paying to become an intern somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So well, there, are, there are ample artists that work for exposure. They're just not very good, generally. <laughs> not, not all of them, but I mean, you know, when you're starting out, you can't get shows or, you know, whatever. You have to do some of that. Yeah. But just to put it in perspective, I've been performing for, what, over 40 years, and I've gotten three shows as a result of shows I did for free for exposure. So <laughs> the, the exposure, even though it might be you know, profitable in one sense, you're, if you're ever counting on it for dollar for dollar to be worth it, it's never worth it. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, whenever, I, I was just gonna say, whenever I get an email from someone you know, asking about my availability for a show, the longer the email, <laughs> the less money they're paying. Yeah. Yeah. When they tell me about their vision and where they see it going and all, and I'm like, yeah, they're, they're, they're just dropping, 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 yeah. dropping. Um, and not that I don't do free shows, but it is my choice where I donate my talent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's my choice what cause is important to me. No one else gets to dictate that. Can yeah. speak on that is just to respond and say, can you demonstrate an ROI of previous people? 
What, the, what, the, what, what I did, I, I actually got offered from a major car company. They, they asked me if I would do a corporate gig for a party. And they said, what are your rates? And I said to my rates, and they, and they came back, do you think you would do it for free, for exposure? And I said, oh, let me think about it. And then I waited like a day or two, and I emailed them back, and I said, you know what? Instead of exposure, why don't we do a trade? I'll do the show, you give me a car. Yeah. And I said, I go, I will use the car to go to all my gigs, I'll dr drive to all my gigs. Imagine the exposure your car company is going to get with me driving my, your car all over the United States. And the guy laughed. And I go, what are you laughing at? He's like, that's ridiculous. I go, your car costs you less in, in, in the grand scheme of things than, than my one day. Like, that one day is probably a, a good chunk of money for you. A car is like, you, you know... You can probably piss away a car and not even notice it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, and he thought that was absurd. And I was like, all right, we'll talk to you later then. You know? Well, interesting. Yeah. You so, use the word write off next time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. That's right. So um, we, we can't hear people yelling from the audience. So, um, I mean, like on the video and such. So, so if you have comments or uh, there's a microphone out here, please uh, come and. Um, it's, it's fine to engage in a conversation, just uh, we want to make sure that everybody can hear everybody's point. So um, it sounds like you had a, something to contribute in, yes, uh, from bridge so, building perspective. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm working, the, I just find the whole, I found the whole conversation about creativity just, it, it's so, it is so vital now beyond almost, I think, any time in, in history. What I, what I, I'm a, I run a, um, I'm a director of a consultancy, um, runs, works, operates in North America. And almost the biggest, one of the biggest problems I'm now seeing is a lack of creativity because the people coming through our standard courses aren't being taught that. What they're being taught is process. They're not being taught to think. Mm. So by the time they're actually coming out, what's happening is that we're not, we're not seeing anybody able to solve problems. They're just following a process. And that's why, I mean, the reality is that in North America right now, there's, there's a $1 trillion underspend in terms of infrastructure. That's why bridges are falling down. That's why airports are failing. That's why roads are falling apart. All that sort of stuff. Everyone's applying the same answers that were applied 40, 40 50 years ago in terms of um, trying to solve the problems today. That's not going to solve the problem. We've got to move into something new. And, and what I love about coming to, to things like DragonCon is listening to the value of creativity. It has a value beyond, beyond the dollar. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to put a dollar value to it because people got to get paid and people got to live. But the value is far, far greater because that's where everything comes from. It comes from the creative process. Yes. And being able to get that down and be able to be able to explain to, to everybody how important this is is just so is, is so vital in my view. I mean, I'd love all my team to just come along and, and do Dragon Con. Don't, don't worry about the cons <laughs> play, don't do that. But just just get challenged because that's what that's what this does. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm sorry, that was kind of my intro to the question, which is in your view, from you, you guys live in this world all the time. This is how you deal with it. It's, and and sorry to shout out about the, the construction thing. It was just. It's a, it, it was the funniest thing. You felt thing. it. It yeah. hit you in yeah. a certain way. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, because it, it just, it, it, it was funny. We, we were offered TV exposure on a show. For, in the UK, there was a big show about renovating houses, and we were doing basements at the time. And they said, look, if you do the basement for free, you'll get the exposure on the show. Now, the, the reality is in a construction project, 90% of the cost of the, of, of the build is materials and the, and the labor. So the profit we make is, is about 10%. So there's no way that building that was ever going to cover the cost and mm -mm. we would need to work for years and years and years to get a return on investment. So we obviously said no. But the, the, I think the, the thing that I'm trying to get my head around is how, can, how do I use the situation I'm in and, the, and, and if you like the authority I'm in to, to start to access people like you to get that into my guys' thinking and back into the colleges and back into the universities to really to say creativity is, is, is the number one thing that is going to solve all the problems that we have. The climate change issues, the way that we view each other, the way that we understand each other, the way we relate. It's not going to come through process, it's going to come through creativity. And that's, and that's kind of, it's a big question, but that's kind of where my head's at. Well, I have had from time to time companies will hire me to come in and do a show and then talk on like creativity or, or how I think to put things together and how it can affect them. And there's other things, you know, sometimes with teamwork or, you know, but when you do what I do, find different ways to market yourself. And so you just take the skills that you have, whether it be, you know, creativity or communication. And then I put together a show based on that. So I, I come in, I fool them, I get their interest up. 
and then I explain the ideas behind um, you know what what they've asked me to do so the idea of creativity do some creative magic tricks and then explain the process behind how that came together and how it applies to them so as a you know as a company you could hire Ian to come in and tell jokes and then explain you know kind of what you're wanting people to understand so do you, any of you have recommendations on how to encourage the valuing of creativity? Um, portfolios are always key. That would, you know, that's the background in graphic design is, is building a portfolio of some sort. Um, even if it's a project page, um, any exposure, uh, feedback from former clients, Hey, we use them, and you nail them. You know, you, you you go to you know if you did a successful project, and say, look, pay me first, and then I really want to write up from you know working with whoever is on that side as the project managers and stuff, um, because people do look at that. Because and forming connections, I utilize LinkedIn all the time. Um, I mean, I even pay for the premium section just so that I could reach other people. And it's amazing once you start doing that. But um, having a portfolio of some sort of your work, that's really key. If you had, even on your LinkedIn page, and I've done this, is writing a small article about what you do mm -hmm. and doing that once a month even and sending that out to even your followers on LinkedIn or your connections and then putting that on to uh, making a business page for Facebook works um, you know so you're linking that yeah. and if you can get anyone to reference you in an article they're doing you know, say it's, I don't know, a mason of some sort, yeah. and say, hey, I interviewed you, yeah. so now you're now referenced twice. And the key really is to get, not necessarily the immediate people, it's getting the, the secondary and third tier people. You know, um, find me on LinkedIn, I'll, I, you know, these are, the, these are the tricks of marketing. Um, and that's that's really the thing is and, and it's connections. So, one of the um, one of the things I do uh, again, your, your skill set as a comic and as an actor and as a writer is transferable to many things. And one of the other things that I get to do is work as a corporate trainer. And it really it has to come very sincerely from the top down. I, I think when people, particularly when they're young and they start a job, they come in with ideas. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's either a week or a year or two years where that creativity and that spark is beaten out of them. Yep. And they are not encouraged. Uh, they're, they don't speak up in meetings. They learn, oh, my ideas, my creativity doesn't have value here. And the business case on the other side of it that you can use to encourage that is companies are leaving money on the table when they are not adequately resourcing and, and exposing themselves to the ideas of the new people, and not just the young people, but maybe people that come into the company as a second career. Um, if, they're not, if they're not really open to that, they are losing money. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's how you encourage your, your, the senior management to, to be open to it <coughs> and not beating it out of people. People that, you know, they go to work like, <sighs> mm -hmm. instead of, huh. You know, it, 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 it's a very subtle thing, uh, but it's a very important thing to stop, you know, punishing people for wanting to bring some of their best stuff to work. I think that's what you should want. And sometimes it's actually seeking out the companies um, and liking them. Um, if you know of an article where a company treats its employees really well, that means they're open-minded. Mm -hmm. So reading Business Insider, Fast Company, or is it Fast, fast company. company? Yeah, an INC. Um, it, what we do is a business. And that was, that was the one thing that I was sat down when I went to art school, which is hardly ever taught. And the director of you know, the school said, art is a business. If you don't know that now, you could leave. <laughs> 
and he's yeah. serious. I mean, you know, you can talk about artistic integrity, but you, which we have, but if you want to make a paycheck, you have to know your value and what your creative right, creativity can bring you. But see, I don't want to hog it all. No, but, but, <laughs> I, no, but you're, you're right. I think that there's, all, there's a, a major, uh, the biggest issue here is that there's a, a cultural thing, and it's not just from people who, 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 do, who work in traditional businesses or whatever. It's also from within because we've been taught that it's fun it create creative mm -hmm. things artwork mm -hmm. so we even do it like you were saying well it's not just not just in 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 the creative world and then but if you listen to your example it was a television show yeah. mm. so yeah. the people inside the television show said well do it for free it's exposure right so it's still a creative it's it's a television show so it's within this group you have that you know where you have to tell people this is a business mm -hmm. And you know what we've seen it a million times. Oh, well, you're you know worried about being selling out, worried about all mm -hmm. this sort of things. But culturally, we just don't value. Um, we value it, of course, but we don't think of it as a business, and we don't think of it as something that is the nuts and bolts of running a company or the nuts and bolts of of, of making a product or or whatever. And I think that's something that maybe we need to rebrand it. I know they've done that a little bit. That's what team building is. When you go do team building, I've done a bunch of these, you know, week long convention type things where the co company calls you in and they'll, they'll, they'll make you do run improv groups or these little things. And it's, and it's really just them being creative, but to them it's, you know, they call it team building, right? And, um, and I think maybe that's part of it is re in that area, in that er area, rebranding so that it's not Oh, fun and creativity. Maybe it's like, oh, we're doing these exercises that help you, you know, get your brain working. I, I don't know, but it's yeah. like there's it's something cultural in our society that we're going to have to start with kids and start really educating people that it's all valid. I think, which I think we are doing. You know. Valid and valuable. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, almost, it's almost like you guys are venture capitalists in the sense of you're going to you you basically you've got hundred hundreds of ideas, most of which aren't probably going to work or they're not going to quite fit or whatever. But then the one idea that actually lands, the one song you write, the one the one show you put together, will suddenly be the one, and that will that, that covers everything. And that's almost the, the thinking about that's almost the world you guys live in is that you're you're pumping out ideas, you're thinking about things, you're trying to mix them all together, you're trying to get things to work, and then a whole bunch of stuff just it, it just doesn't quite come together, and then that then that thing will, um, and that's the that's the risk that you that you seem to live with. I mean, but there's there's, no, there's another aspect which is this is that when you look at business, business has its own demands logistics, organization, all of those things. What we do, because we're working for ourselves, we are on that, on that creative edge, uh, so that we have to find a creative solution that'll actually work. Mm -hmm. And then, it, for example, uh, I know plenty of authors or people who want to be writers who say, all I want to do is write. And they, and they, by saying that, divorce themselves from the business side. Mm -hmm. Well, in a business, you don't divorce yourself from the business side because there's a whole hierarchy that deals yep. with that. So the people who need creativity have got absolutely no material link to the people who are making the decisions above them. And, and to, to kind of scroll back to where we started this, um, one of the things about creativity is that it can be taught. And we used to teach it when we very much had, you know, apprenticeship situations oh, yeah. where you were hands-on learning how to do something. You know, Kurt is doing his, his wood turning. I've been doing leather work, and it's forcing me to be creative because I'm now facing problems I have never faced mm -hmm. before in my whole entire life, and I'm having to figure out how to make these things work. And every other project I do fails, okay? But the one, the interim ones get better. I can see that mm -hmm. I'm making those steps. So until we essentially absolve people of the stigma of having failed, okay, uh, and until we begin to encourage experimentation and creativity, and encourage it not only by saying you're doing a good job, but but, but creating situations mm -hmm. that demand creativity, we are never going to you know make that cultural change and get people to doing this. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. So failure is not only not a, I mean, failure is an option. 
It is, yeah. and it's a um, good it's a good learning tool. There, there's one company. It's, it's not Bell Labs, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah. one company actually <coughs> honors the failures. It's like we worked on this project, so they do have an honorarium the, the, the when it comes to a failed project. Yeah. And, you know that everyone's worked hard on, yeah. and then they just show it. But they honored the failure. You know. Well, and that's part of the problem too. I think is that there's no. Oh, there is, but it's not quite of a, as much of a direct path a lot of times in industries like ours. Like if you think about, if you think about filmmaking and you want to be a, a, a movie director, you don't go to school, get a degree in movie directing, and then they go, okay, here's $20 million and here's, yeah. here's, um, you know, here's, here's Brad Pitt, go make your movie. Right. It's still about who you know, who you mark, mm -hmm. like who, who, all the different things that, that you, you work your way up and, and you make the right connection and, and you get somebody attached to your script. That's all these sort of things. And, and there's a high failure rate in that too. But, but people look at that and go, yeah, but if I go get this degree, then I go to this company and I get a job doing this and they see that that's, that seems, that's a simple path. Yeah. And it, it, it doesn't seem like, a lot of times I think it's, oh, you're just, you're just out there doing your thing and you're throwing it against the wall and seeing if it, it, it sticks. And most people are going to fail. And, you know, I mean, that's the thing. I live in LA and you hear people all the time, you know, we all know the joke about the waiter who's actually an actor and then, you know, oh, they'll be here for three years and then they'll go back to wherever they're from and, mm -hmm. and you know, get a regular job. And, and that's how it seemed because, it's, because there isn't this direct path and there is a lot of, of hard work, but there's also a lot of luck or, or, or yeah. circumstance that happens that who you know and what you know and, and, and where you are sometimes. So this, this is true. that's hard to get over as well as a cultural stigma. Can be. Kathy? So for about the last 15 minutes, my brain's been going to K-12, pre-K-12 education, because that's kind of the world I live in. But how do we connect these lessons learned that you guys obviously know to either the pre-service university instruction, the current teachers that are in the environment, which are very still very much in a let's teach in a process, mm -hmm. no wrong answer kind of approach. Um, do you have opportunities to go into schools? Do administrators welcome you to teach that? Because a lot of our teachers coming out of university are not going to have that. They're right. choosing the path you guys are choosing. Not necessarily can I be creative and be in the classroom imparting that. How do we, because to me, that's the root of how we change this culture. So what would you guys say about that? Um, for, for me, um, I'm a president of a Friends of a library association and libraries are now becoming the front line of teaching um, that the system that I have is uh, actually offers a high school diploma through our library so for, for me being a, a creative person and being part of this is we make sure that we raise funds for the library because librarians have ideas. They want to present, they want to teach. We have musicians who are librarians. And so um, for me personally, it's, it's whatever financial support that I can raise to help this organization. And that's what I know I can do. Because as a researcher as well, Libraries are my thing. So that's in my toolbox, and that's where I go, not necessarily with the school board thing. I know this, I know the institu institution, and I know that even through the ALA, which is the American Library Association, there's support there. Um, so also, I'll do lobbying on behalf of the library with the state and local governments to get more educational. Uh, access for people that because schools are getting cut all the time so to me that's that's the safeguard a little bit does it I don't know if that answers your question but <laughs> I, I'm afraid of children so <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that the schools have changed their approach to make um, things easier for the schools and the teachers in the sense that they're kind of looking for easily quantitative right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And so if, one, they've got to try to get all these kids to the school they possibly can and they've got all these standards so that they get their state money and their federal money and they've taken their own creativity out. Mm -hmm. And they've got 
you know, less resources, more time constraints, mm -hmm. and they want to be able to go, nope, look, here's A, B, and C. We got all these kids and they, and they make all the checklists. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the exact opposite of creativity. Mm -hmm. So they've, they've changed the system. Mm -hmm. They themselves don't work within a creative system. Right. You know, they take the time to create uh, an environment that encourages creativity, they're, they may lose out on federal funding. So it, the, the system has to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the system is flawed. That's a big part of the problem, and that's why you have the problem both through the school systems and then beyond into the corporate world, is that creativity is just kind of, there's no place for it within the system. So the way that I see it is that the best way to combat it is at home. And, um, you know, I'm the mother of a 10-year-old son, and I try to expose him to art and get him doing artistic things and creating and ingesting art because it, it has to start one mind at a time. And I think the reason that people like us are almost anomalies to be creators in society because most people that just gets beaten out of them as time mm -hmm. goes by. So even, it doesn't even matter if you have kids, just at the end of the day, pick up some poetry and read a few pages of poetry or take an afternoon to stroll around the art museum. You should be doing stuff every day that involves ingesting art and before you know it, you are awakening that within you. Anytime I feel like I'm getting clogged up personally. Yeah, I expose myself to some art I have never taken in before. And after doing that for a few days or so, then all of a sudden the ideas are awake and alive again. So I think it's just something we all need to take on ourselves and to share with our children is that art has to be a part of daily mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. both creating it and experiencing other people's art. And it's, it's crucial and we have to do it on a personal level. You know, one thing that my, my daughter's, um, <clears throat> my daughter's a freshman this year in high school and one of the things that her middle school did, but specifically her high school does, um, and I've seen this a lot more, and, and again, I don't know if it's just because I live in Los Angeles, but her school has three or four magnet programs. Mm -hmm. So she's in the performing arts magnet. So she's, a, you know, she's an actress, and that's what she, what she likes to do and wants to do. So anybody, all the kids that are in the performing arts magnet, they, they have to do all the regular classes, right? Science, history, and math. But all of the, the performing arts magnet kids go to the same classes and the classes are taught, they revolve around performing arts. So their English class will be around something performing arts. So they'll read plays, they'll read, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be a different English class than the kids who are in the new media performing arts or the SAS, the School for Advanced Studies magnet. So it's really cool how they infuse what they do, and a lot of times it's art, into all of the other classes if you're in that magnet. Mm -hmm. So it's going along with what, what, what you want. Your math has performing arts involved in it somehow. And everything has performing arts involved in, in, that, in, in the subject. It's really cool. And, I, and I'm, I'm seeing that more and more and more. Um, and I'm seeing other kids having to, you know, the kids in the SAS program that are just academic, but they, they, they have to take a, like a dance class or something. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's really cool. It's a really, gr it's a really great school. And, um, yeah, I think, I think we're seeing a lot more of that, and I think that's going to help long term, you know. My turn? It's Derek. Yeah. yeah hey, Ian's Derek. right, by the way. I have a high school uh, student in my house now. That's new for me. I got married and have an instant daughter. Um, <laughs> and uh, we recently just moved her to a magnet school, because Georgia does it too. Um, and they have math, and they have STEM, they have science ones. And she's in a brand new type of school that they're trying to, they got from Northern Europe. And so like the first time they're using that in America, there's like four or five schools doing it. So we'll see how it works, but it's a very interesting system. Yeah. Like, in fact, the school day is shorter and their policy is zero homework. Wow. They're not allowed to do homework. You have to do everything in class. So when they, the classes are shorter, and then at the end, the last half of the class, you do your homework. If you have questions, your teacher's there. Yeah. And, that, and by the time you're done with that day, all your work's done. So you yeah. have no homework. It's wow. bizarre. But they say it works in other countries. They're trying it here. There's like four or five schools doing it. So because she hates school, so we try to get her into something, <laughs> something I, I she would like a do. high school do-over. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, I was the same way. Uh, where was I point? Oh, yeah, so you were talking about 
companies and creativity. So I went through a experience in the past two weeks. I got uh, headhunted to come in for interviews for a big company called Georgia Pacific. Everybody knows them. They probably, they're probably the, the, the paper in the bathrooms here. I didn't realize how much stuff they do. Like it's everything. A lot. Everything. <laughs> So I'm thinking, you know, it's a Koch brothers group. They're evil, right? Okay, whatever. Um, so I was in the interview. I didn't know what the job was going to be. I wanted the job. I talked myself out of it in the after interview because I asked questions that they didn't have answers to. But the job actually was a creative job where I would be the project manager for like all of their experimental stuff where my job would have been to manage all these little tiny job projects of people that work with them, they have creative ideas, and they just say, here's $100,000, see if it works. This is how Georgia Pacific works, I didn't know this. Um, so that's what they do, and I guess I've learned since, talking to other people, that many of these big evil corporations, they have these programs, I never mm -hmm. knew. And why don't they talk about this? Because how many kids would go, oh, I want to do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that would have been the best job. And then I asked the question, I said, what would my work day look like? And, that, and then a few days later, they gave me a call. I was like, yeah, we have to rewrite this job because we don't really know what it is, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know what it is. Give it to me. <laughs> but yeah, so it sounded great. I wanted to do it. But I. I my point was, don't discount even like the most generic, yeah. boring companies, because mm -hmm. if they're big, they're doing things like that, mm -hmm. and nobody realizes there's a job there that's creative. I was talk they gave me the list of the things they're working on. A lot of AI, some crazy robotic stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I had no idea it's, that these it, guys are doing this. Here's the thing, though, if you go into something like this, is under, if you sign a, read the contract, please, because say you come up with something creative, um, make sure that you'll, you'll find that they will own it, and you will oh, yes. not. So, you know, so make sure that occurs, because my brother-in-law has like 14 pages of patents, and they're all owned by IBM. So um, be, be cognizant of that. I think the thing is, is I think in general, when I went to school, college, my dad just said, because my two brothers went off to the military, and, like, and he's like, I don't care if you study basket weaving, you're going to college. That gave me a free reign to do anything I wanted. <laughs> so I, I combined classes, I took up history classes, took up weird math classes, like math, a liberal art. And there's a problem with the liberal art. You know, going to school for liberal art is because it exposes you to different things, you become a problem solver. And I've run into other people who are problem solvers, a good friend of mine. She had a master's degree in liberal art, and she's like, yes, I work for, like, I think JEA, which is Electrical Authority, because she can think outside of the box. Mm -hmm. And that oh, is yeah. the thing that people um, do not value as well. It's like, oh, my God, I can actually think. And this bringing up that whole Steve Jobs thing, it's like, if you can think how to connect, I don't know, comedy with mathematics, then you, you're set. You can do that. Mm -hmm. when, sign that read, their, read your contract. <laughs> when, I, when I leave here, and I'm, oh, I don't want to leave Dragon Con. I never <laughs> want to leave Dragon Con. But when I leave here um, and go back home, I'm actually working on a project um, with a large uh, uh, medical uh, home care company. Uh, they were having a problem with cybersecurity. And their, their IT team would send these long emails on how to protect yourself from, you know, or, or be more cybersecurity aware. And no one was reading the emails. Mm -mm. And they were still getting all these cyber breaches. Mm -hmm. And they actually, I don't know what made them do this, but they said, well, maybe if we make it funny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how they found me. And they explained what the problems they were having. I took their problems. I wrote a, 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 a stand-up bit. They asked for three minutes. I wrote five. They liked it. We're shooting it when I get back. Okay, because they're taking a comedic approach to maybe if people can laugh at cybersecurity, they can do it. Okay, but this is this is free for you. 
Okay. Oh no, I charge. I, I know, no. For, but <laughs> oh. the advice I'm going to give you is free today. Oh, okay. Today, uh, if you have a square, exposure. I'll pay you. Okay. <laughs> You, you have to get the person, you have to do the hook within six seconds. That is the, that is the key. In print, you have about 12 seconds. So if you do that, if you find that special hook, and that's the problem with emails, nobody reads them. Junk mail, I don't look at anything, because everything's, I mean, I was in that industry. I know how to manipulate people, but yeah. <laughs> Get it down. Is that six on your seconds. LinkedIn? I know how to manipulate people. That's <laughs> no, awesome. No, no. But you now know. No, thank but you. But yeah, six seconds. Yeah. To find no, that really one thing. It's funny that the same people that won't read the cybersecurity emails are the same people opening up the fake Fisher emails. Yeah. Like, oh, absolutely. Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And you know what? The fakes. If you look at the fake cybersecurity emails, they're short. Yeah. They're. Hey, guess what? Blah blah. Done. Yeah. And so many people just hit on it. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Hey. Hello. Can y'all hear me? A little uh, closer. A little closer. Yeah. Okay. Um, I keep hearing y'all talk, and there's something that keeps kicking in my head. I was thinking about some friends of mine who have a podcast class radio station and um, my friend will say yeah people want to uh, talk to me and they're like uh, can you can we have coffee because they want to pick their brain mm -hmm. and she says she hates that because it's like you're getting my ideas for free and she's like she does her and her co-host does a, um, a, a workshop Figure out what they technically call it, but they'll bring people in and they'll tell them, "Well, this is what you need. You know, what is your idea for a podcast? Because I'm not gonna tell you what to do. I want to know what you want to do. So they'll have like a day long um, class or whatever, and you know they'll provide food, whatever, and they just want to know what do you want? How long do you want to do it? Because they've been doing it for like six years with 1,000 episodes, and they just, like, took a break. Because they was like, we've been doing this for so long with no days off. Like, they would literally do it three days a week, even if they had, like, um, even if it was Christmas, the, and, and it fell on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, which is the day that they would do it, they would still do it. So... Like, how do y'all feel when people are like, oh, I need to talk to you about an idea I have. But yeah, technically. I, I get those phone calls. I, I, I get the, hey, let's go for coffee, too. Uh, Michael, do you get those at all? Yeah. I, yeah, you have to. Yeah, well, I, I, I get those all we, the time. We do get those. And, and, the, and the solution to that, I mean, one of the reasons I've not been doing a lot in the Skep Track over the, the past several years is that, um, I organize 18 hours of writing instruction here at DragonCon, mm -hmm. and I hire other writers to come in and teach people how to do what we do. Um, and, and we make sure that everybody understands this is a very contractual thing. I'm going to teach you how to put me out of a job, therefore you're going to pay me. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people want to pick your brain, you know, if it's just someone asking a question in the hall here at DragonCon, that's one thing everybody deals with that or and, and you know if it's if it's uh, uh say a young author or a young comedian says to you guys hey can you give me a couple of pointers i mean that's, that's a that's a peer-to-peer -peer thing mm -hmm. you know and 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 you might go ahead and give them free advice but when somebody is asking you to basically set up their career for them uh and use your expertise you're a consultant yeah. Uh, yeah. and at that point mm -hmm. you know you deserve to charge them and get paid uh, you know, that legitimate amount of, uh, the proper and, amount of money. And they say that, they'd be like, okay, so how much are you, how much are you going to pay me for this? Like, and my you, friend. You, you have to be up front. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and, I, I have, I, I just met with a, a non-profit, and she's like, I'd love to hire you. And I'm like, well, this is the price. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to lower it. Yeah. You have, you have to be firm. And the thing is, is it's really weird. It's, it's like counterintuitive. If P, if you know that is the value you are giving and you stick to it, say, okay, our meeting is $150 to meet for an hour. 
And if they don't, if let them ponder on meeting yeah. with you. It's crazy. If they say, okay, a couple days later, it's like you gave them a value of this is how much. So in their brain, they're thinking, oh my God, I might get a lot. You know, whereas I've had the ones where it's like, yeah, we can meet for coffee. And I, for me, I'm like, it's throwaway stuff. If it, but if I tell them this is how much it is, this is what you'll get out of it. And that's what really you'll have to do is like, okay, if you're gonna do these kind of meetings, jot down just a couple notes and come up with a price. And this is how much it is. Um, even include like, hey, finder's fees, stuff like that, um, because it is a business. Um, because if not, you'd be doing meetings all week long and you'll barely get coffee. Mm -hmm. And know? like, yeah. they don't get paid for what they do. That's, it's a love that they have. So it's like, you know, they get like people, like the listeners. But, we the thing, will. but even with podcasting, things have changed that yeah. you could get you know, advertisement and stuff. And really that's something you just may want to say, look, go look for advertisement, go solicit, and then come back and talk to me. And then I can probably help you. Or you give them one nugget, you give them one nugget. Okay, just one, go solicit. You know, Audible is always looking for, adver you know, a podcast to be on, to say, look, this is the home, this is it. This is the homework you need to do before you talk to me. Yeah. That, that um, is that, probably one of the best that is, things. That is how they do it. That is how they mm -hmm. do it. They know how to do it. They've been doing it for a while. But yeah. that, that thought, they... You, you can't make people do things yeah. that they don't want to do. Yeah, just that's when you have to walk away. just made me think about them, like, yeah. you know. People. So this is one of the best times to be a magician because virtually every magician that ever comes to my show immediately lets me know they're way better than me to start with. So <laughs> most magicians, if you ask them, are better than Copperfield. So I don't face that as much as other people. So kind of nice. Well, these aren't limited to, to the creative. I mean, no. I'm a physician. I almost don't want to tell people I'm a doctor. Oh, my God. Everybody and I tell people I'm a doctor. Exactly. And I'm, you know, I finally just had to, I, like I have a girlfriend who was going to come to a a thing that we did at Disney or something and um, and I said okay you can stay in my room but this is a no bitching zone yeah you Ooh. everybody's feet hurt everybody's <laughs> knees hurt everybody's backs hurt I don't want to mm -hmm. hear it I get paid money to listen to yep. people complain yes and I'm not gonna do it for free if you do something that hurts immediate like you break something okay I, I'm on that okay but but anything else you know that costs money if you're bleeding in front of me i will yeah, help you out if you're sanguinating i'll totally hook you up that's okay if you're if you need a cordial precordial thump i'll i'll hit you but the point is that that that's a value there's a value to that i you have invested thousands of hours mm -hmm. learning to do what you do mm -hmm. so it looks easy but it's not easy no and one's. it takes effort it takes a lot of effort mm -hmm. so one more question i'm sorry i just had to put that no, on because um, it's a good thing I just want to say, working in the school system, um, there are so many wonderful creative teachers who can't do what they want because right now all we want is quantifiability. Yes. I want to know if I'm moving into this town and I live in New Jersey and paying these taxes, um, which I know everybody pays for wicked taxes, um, I want to know what the number of my school is. What number did you come in in your, you know, in your county? What number of school are you? The fifth highest or whatever. So these teachers are stuck trying to um, just make these numbers go up when they really would like to do other things. But I think also I see very early on, um, people are almost forced to choose. Are you the math kid yeah. or the art kid? Mm -hmm. Are you the, the writer kid yeah. or the science kid? Mm -hmm. And even, and I see kids who are told um, or seem to be told, well, you'll never make a, a living at that. Well, that's fine. You can still do it and get your worth from it. I'm a costumer. It's not what pays my mortgage. Mm -hmm. I get paid fairly when I can do it. Unfortunately, I can't do it and yeah. live on it. Mm -hmm. But it's not any less important to me to do. No. And I can do my day job, and I can do that job and get joy and money out of both of them. And I think a lot of people feel like they have to pick. I, yeah. I, I think we need to bring the word polymath into yes. our lexicon so that you know, just because you're 
a doctor, a comedian. You could do other things. There's nothing to limit. You know, we hear the highlights of those people who are polymaths. You know, those are those are like my mentors. It's like, yeah, yeah of yeah, course. Absolutely. I don't know. You know, and that's what got me into research. <coughs> absolutely. So I want to give y'all a couple of seconds for shameless plugs. Oh, so problem solving for solve this tonight, 7 p.m. Um, do you know where we are, Megan? Hyatt, I think yes. Um, as I as I mentioned in my opening, Leanne Lord, uh, all things me are at veryfunnylady.com. Uh, I would love if you guys followed me on IG, uh, Instagram for the older folks, uh, and Twitter. It, either uh, my name, Leanne Lord, or. Um, under a uh, very funny lady because mildly amusing lady wasn't available. <laughs> um, you know, I, you can always follow me on all the social mediums, but um, if you uh, want to see what I do, I have two uh, hour TV specials. One's called Critical and Thinking. One is called Extraordinary, and they're both on streaming services like uh, Amazon Prime, iTunes, Google Play, those sort of things. So check those out. And also I have a, a, a podcast Called, uh, that we also call Critical and Thinking with uh, Ty Barnett, um, another comedian, um, winner of Last Comic Standing. So me and Ty Barnett doing a, a podcast uh, once a week, Critical and Thinking, if you guys want to check that out too. Thanks. Please check out my band, The Murder of Jane Crow. You can see us here at Dragon Con today at 2.30 on the Weston Concourse stage. And we will also be set up the rest of the day in the merch hall um, right next to the Walk of Fame, bottom mm. floor of the Marriott. So we'll be set up there for the rest of the day as well. And we've got all kinds of fun stuff to share with you there. And um, outside of that, just look us up online, The Murder of Jane Crow. We've got music and videos and stuff all over the place. Yeah, I'm on all the normal social media. And you can find all the books on Amazon.com. They've, they've got things I don't even remember having written. <laughs> <laughs> Magic Hurt. Uh, you know, magichurt.com and all the social media. It's spelled like magic and Kurt with one C. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. We appreciate it. And thank you for coming. See you later. Bye. Bye.